Okay, buddy, I think maybe I'll just get started here. Okay. So welcome everyone to our first ever Zoom presentation of the Kingsbridge Historical Society. I'm Nick Dembowski, president of the Kingsbridge Historical Society. I, before we get going, I wanted to definitely thank uh, Councilman Dinowitz, Eric Dinowitz, for the grant he gave us through the um, Department of Youth and Community Development to get the cameras and laptop and uh, Zoom subscription so we can do these events. Um, I also wanted to thank all of our recent donors and people have signed up for member as for memberships because uh, because of you, we're going to be turning on the water in our headquarters the, at Edge Hill. Uh, we're, we have a plumber lined up to bust open the street and connect us to the main water supply um, within either this week or next week. And we have you to thank for that. And then, of course, I definitely want to thank uh, Buddy Stein for joining us today. Um, as, a, as a local historian, I really treasure the Riverdale Press um, because, you know, not we don't not ever every era of history has does our little neighborhood here have um, a newspaper to refer to to learn about events of, of the period. But, you know, it's a real treasure to have uh, the, the press to look back to to find out what was going on and what was important to people living in the neighborhood at, at various times. Um, and, you know, many people that have been in the area for a long time remember very fondly your tenure as editor at the Riverdale Press from um, 1978 to 2005. And you just hear it from old timers all the time about how great the paper was um, when you were running it. So without further ado, I'd like to turn this over to Buddy Bernard Stein. Thanks, Nick. In the winter of 1949, my father, David Stein, installed a drawing board and a typewriter table in my parents' bedroom at 3900 Greystone Avenue and began fashioning the Riverdale Press. I was eight when the first issue appeared on April 20th, 1950. It included my first byline on a one paragraph story about a meeting of my Cub Scout pack. I was raised to become the editor of the Riverdale Press. I rebelled against my parents' plans for me by deciding to go to graduate school and become a professor, moving as far from Riverdale as possible by enrolling at the University of California in Berkeley. My dad never stopped hoping and never stopped scheming to get me back, but it was my brother Richard who pulled me in. Our father was weakened by a series of heart attacks and Richard stepped in to serve as general manager he wouldn't commit to the role though, unless I joined him. And in September, 1978, I did. My father relinquished the editor's desk in the corner of the newsroom to me, but all I could think was, I'm a fraud. I don't know what I'm doing. Three months later, the neighborhood was struck by a crisis. A tidal wave of co-op conversion plans swamped Riverdale, where the vast majority of residents were tenants in rent controlled, or rent stabilized apartments. In Manhattan, many tenants cheered when a co-op conversion plan arrived. But in Riverdale, most were terrified when a six inch thick document hit their doorsteps and told them to put up thousands of dollars or to leave their homes. I assigned the co-op beat to myself. And over the course of a year, I wrote more than 80 stories on it. Some of them looked at the issues in depth and a couple exposed the ruthless tactics of shady landlords, but most of them were short, simple articles. They reported that such and such a building had gotten a prospectus, summarized its terms, and quoted tenants on their reactions. From writing those articles, I finally learned what my job was because they taught me what community journalism is really about. What those stories did was let people know that they weren't alone. They informed them that neighbors up the block or across the parkway were facing the same decisions. In some cases, they told them how other buildings planned to respond or included the name of a lawyer and other buildings tenants had hired. They identified political issues around which they could lobby to balance the scales between landlord and tenant. Letting readers know what they shared and how they could come together was the purpose of community news, I realized. 
And I thought, I could do that. As I gained confidence, my poor father felt the force of the old Chinese proverb about being careful what you wish for when I began writing most of the editorials. My dad had a way of disarming those with whom he disagreed. I wrote with a sharper pen. Six months into my tenure, Stanley Friedman, then at the height of his powers as the democratic boss of the Bronx, was screaming at me because I condemned the Koch administration's plans for a superhighway on Manhattan's west side, arguing that local residents would be better served if the money went to mass transit. But the editorial that really upset my dad, I think you have the wrong slide up there. <laughs> the editorial that really upset my dad was published in March, 1980. It was headlined, The Woman Question. And it criticized the business-oriented service clubs, the Kiwanis Club, the Rotary Club, and so on, for excluding women from membership. Now, my father was a founder of the Riverdale Kiwanis Club. Worse, he got an angry phone call from the president of the Bronx Rotary Club, who was also the president of Northside Bank. And Northside Bank was a major advertiser. Later, my mother told Richard and me that she said to my father, you're still the publisher, stop them. And he responded that he had urged us to take on the job and he had to let us chart our own path. If you wanna know what courage is, look no further than my father who feared that his sons were gonna ruin the work of his lifetime, but wouldn't prevent them from doing what they thought was right. While my father and I may have had different views on political and social issues, we agreed that what made Riverdale special was its mix of homes and apartment buildings and its abundant green and open space. Just as I had faced a transformative co-op boom early in my tenure, early in his, my dad had faced a boom in apartment building that threatened to overwhelm the community. Developers wanted to continue the transformation of what had been a sleepy neighborhood of three or 4,000 families by replacing homes with Riverview apartments and, strip, and a strip mall overlooking the Hudson, by encroaching on Fieldston and by obliterating low density housing in North Riverdale and Spite and Idle. In perhaps the most passionate editorial he ever wrote, my father warned of a Riverdale transformed into, quote, canyons of stone. If residents didn't come together to fight for new city regulations, his coverage and advocacy played a pivotal role in winning the historic 1954 rezoning that preserved wide swaths of Riverdale from the developers dynamite and steam shovels. When I took over, the paper continued to highlight threats to the character of the community when developers ignored the impact of their proposals on schools, open space, and human scale. The press joined residents in a long struggle against Tibbet Gardens, an enormous 13 billion high rise the mayor and the real estate board of New York wanted to build in front of Kennedy High School. That effort succeeded. Opposition to building a huge water filtration plant in Van Cortlandt Park did not. And you can put up that second slide now, Nick. And after two decades, the promise the city made that after building the filtration plant, it would restore water to the Jerome Park Reservoir and open land around it for recreation remains, as you can see, unfulfilled. The press fought again and again to strengthen and enforce the special natural area district regulations designed to protect Riverdale's trees and topography. And above all, from 1950 on, the paper never stopped insisting that proposals for growth needed to be guided by comprehensive planning forged with the meaningful participation of those who live here. Just as Seton Park would not exist without my father, Wallenberg Forest would not exist without our coverage as Tom Bird, who led the effort to save it from development, will I'm sure tell you. Slide three. Nick, when a company sought to buy the Campania Mansion across the street from Wave Hill, planning to make it its corporate headquarters with a 40 car parking lot, the press helped launch the successful community campaign against the proposal. In doing so, it likely prevented a wave of similar corporate buyouts of the antebellum ma mansions west of the parkway. Similarly, without the press helping to inform and spur community action, 
every inch of the Delafield Estates 13 acres would today be covered with suburban style ticky tacky condos. An Indian pond, next Nick, might be choked with new McMansions. The fight to preserve the character of the neighborhood extended in my time to historic preservation. The paper nagged the Landmarks Commission to create the Riverdale and the Fieldston Historic Districts. Those two were triumphs shared by the paper's staff and neighborhood advocates, especially Bob Kornfeld, who labored for years to create the Riverdale District. Next slide. That's a carriage house on Sycamore Avenue that is part of the Riverdale Historic District. There are a couple of structures whose preservation I regard as personal triumphs though. The Little Red Lighthouse was among the buildings neglected by the city during the fiscal crisis of the 1970s. As a child, I had loved the book, The Little Red Lighthouse and the Great Gray Bridge. And when my daughter was four, I dug out my copy to read to her. But when we drove on the Henry Hudson Parkway, we didn't see a bright red structure. So when city controller Harrison Golden vowed to find funds to repair and repaint the lighthouse, I wrote an editorial in the form of a letter from my daughter to Golden's young son, who had urged his dad to act. Time passed, nothing happened. So I called Golden's office and told his press guy that my next editorial was gonna denounce the controller as a phony and a do nothing. In a matter of days, Parks Commissioner Henry Stern, who had no interest in giving a rival to Mayor Ed Koch a public relations victory, had had his arm twisted so much that he relented and restored the lighthouse to its former beauty. And you can see it that way today if you visit. The Times ran a story crediting me and Commissioner Stern never forgave me. Closer to home, the Hadley Farmhouse on Post Road one of the oldest, possibly the oldest home in the Bronx still stands, thanks to my reporting. The home's owner had always refused our request to publish a story about her house. But when she died and the house went on the market, I cajoled, I cajoled the bank that acted as trustee for the estate into allowing me inside. I was astonished by the large tree trunks split in half with the bark left on the round side that served as supporting beams and by the vast fireplace. A trip to the New York Historical Society yielded the home's history. And incidentally, a look at the manuscript of Bill Teak's book, Riverdale, Kingsbridge, Spite and Dival, where I found my father's edits and comments. The resulting story described the Hadley House and its history and the likelihood that it would be replaced by boxy two or three family rentals and their parking lots. The day it appeared, I got a call from a prominent Riverdalian Jennifer Rabb, the chair of the Landmarks Commission. She had the commission move quickly to spare the house, which was then bought by a couple who made it their home. It takes no more than a reporter sitting in the gallery at a public meeting to serve as a check on those in power. When a board, a legislature, an elected executive, or a public agency knows their actions will be broadcast to the citizenry, they think twice about what they will say and how they will act. Behind closed doors though, things may be different. In 1986, Louise Jamison, a superb reporter who covered the school beat for the press, began to notice some strange goings on at meetings of Community School Board 10. Local school boards were empowered to appoint principals and assistant principals. Although Board 10 was divided by factions loyal to the regular and reform wings of the Democratic Party and fought bitterly about most things, when it came to choosing new administrators, they were strangely united. Jamie and I began to inquire. What we uncovered was a scandal. Teachers are ideally placed to aid political campaigns. They're literate, they can run copying machines, and they have the summer off, freeing them to offer the manpower politicians need when they face a fall primary. So the two factions of the school board made a deal. Bypassing the superintendent who served at their pleasure, they would vote together for the same slate of administrators after dividing the places available between them. 
To be considered for promotion, a teacher would have to contribute money and labor to the campaigns either of the faction headed by Borough President Stanley Simon or the faction headed by Assemblyman Oliver Capel. By the following year, a Bronx grand jury opened an investigation and legislation was introduced to ban some of the worst abuses. But one little newspaper couldn't end the corruption citywide. That took years more. Still, her expose did lead by a circuitous route to my winning the Pulitzer Prize. Jamie and I were the reporters who wrote the stories about the school board, but the entire newsroom was responsible for them. The other reporters did double duty to allow us to devote an inordinate amount of time to the investigation. I decided to enter the expose for a Pulitzer. I didn't think it would win. I didn't think a little weekly paper was likely even to be considered, but I wanted the staff to know how proud I was of them. When we put the entry together, the newsroom urged me to enter my editorials as well. Again, I didn't expect anything to come of it, but with the help of the reporters and my brother, I cobbled together a portfolio of 10 editorials. To my surprise and delight, I was one of the three finalists for the 1987 prize. Encouraged by that success, a year later, I entered 10 new editorials. I was a finalist again. Well, I was no longer convinced that the Pulitzer was out of reach. So I kept entering until on Tuesday morning, April 14th, 1998, as we were putting that week's issue to bed, a Columbia professor called with a tip, solid enough that we reserve space on page one, just in case. And sure enough, third time was a charm. Nearly half the editorials and the entries that made the finals for the 1987 and 1988 Pulitzers concerned the corruption rampant in the third Koch administration. Corruption that ultimately led to the jailing of the entire leadership of the Bronx Democratic Party. I miss the robust reporting of Jack Newfield <clears throat> and Wayne Barrett of the Village Voice, <clears throat> excuse me, the columnists Murray Kempton, Jimmy Breslin, and Sidney Schamberg, and the beat reporters at the city's dailies, who together uncovered the scandal at the Parking Violations Bureau that sent Bronx boss Stanley Friedman to prison, and the outsized thievery of the Bronx-based defense contractor WedTech that landed Congressman Mario Biaggi and Bronx Borough President Stanley Simon behind bars. I remember lamenting to my brother that the press couldn't possibly keep up with the citywide papers. You're wrong, he said. We beat them to the school board story and we can offer our readers a local perspective that they can't match. Richard was right. Week after week, our front page related the ways in which Riverdale residents were enmeshed in the scandals, usually as pawns, but sometimes as allies of the scoundrels. I commuted to New Haven to cover the trial of Stanley Friedman. Nick, if you go back to the other one. That's me in the upper left corner. This is the press corps at the Stanley Friedman trial. You might also recognize Wayne Barrett, Murray Kempton, Pablo Guzman, Jimmy Breslin, Eric Sean, Josh Friedman, and Larry McShane, who's a Riverdellian. The prosecution of the Friedman trial was led by the United States attorney himself, a guy by the name of Rudolph Giuliani. I was not surprised when it came time to cover Mayor, Giul Mayor Giuliani by his ego, his bluster, his win at any cost attitude. As to WedTech, with Deputy Editor Tom Watson taking turns with me in the courtroom, the press covered the WedTech trial in more depth than any other outlet. You can go to the next slide. Next slide. We covered it in such depth because so many local residents and institutions were caught in the toils of a scandal that reached all the way to the Reagan White House. The two lead defendants, Biagi and Simon, were Riverdellians, and one of the WedTech officers had lavished more than a million dollars of loot on his home in Kingsbridge Heights. The key witness against the borough president was his advance man and bag man, a Riverdale resident, 
Other witnesses ranged from the chair of Community Board 8 to a prominent attorney with a home in Fieldston and to the city clerk and deputy borough president, both Riverdellians. The jury also heard testimony from officers of the Hebrew Home for the Aged, the rabbi of Congregation Ohel Torah, the bookkeeper of Riverdale Temple, the pastor of St. Gabriel's Church, the owner of the Riverdale Diner, and the president of the South Riverdale Little League. The names of Angelo's Restaurant on Johnson Avenue and Erring's Tavern on Broadway, Botany Bay, the Riverdale Avenue florist, and Paperbacks Plus, the local bookstore, were included in testimony about how the borough president spent money he extorted. Mr. Simons Gopher testified that he bought copies of Reverend Teague's book there. Next slide. Next slide. Ah, if I hadn't won the Pulitzer Prize, my obituary would be headlined, Bernard Stein, editor who was firebombed. The terrorist attack on the Riverdale Press office on Broadway was certainly the most notorious and the most frightening occurrence of my tenure. But it began with what I regarded as the least controversial of opinions, that Americans have the right to read as they like and think as they please. It was one of those weeks when I was unsure what to write about as my Monday deadline loomed. A week earlier, the big book store chains, B. Dalt, Walden Books, Barnes and Noble, had removed Salman Rushdie's novel, The Satanic Verses, from their shelves in response to the death sentence pronounced by Iran's supreme ruler, Ayatollah Khomeini, on Rushdie and, quote, all those involved in, the pub in its publication. My brother and I had talked about that over lunch with equal indignation. Well, I see no reason why a local paper can't editorialize about national or international issues. <clears throat> I do think a paper like the press is more likely to engage readers if it can point out the local connection. I called Fern Jaffe, the owner of Paperbacks Plus, which was then the only bookstore in the Bronx, to learn her thoughts. She said she and her staff were determined to restock the book, which had already sold out its first order. Now, Richard and I had an agreement. If I planned to write something particularly controversial, I would share it with him, and he had veto power. I didn't show him the editorial that compared the courage of the Little Riverdale bookstore with the cowardice of the big chains. The editorial argued, quote, to suppress a book or punish an idea is to express contempt for the people who read the book or consider the idea. In preferring the logic of the executioner to the logic of debate, the book burners and the Ayatollah Khomeini display their distrust for the principle on which self-government rests, the wisdom and virtue of ordinary people. Motherhood and apple pie, I thought, until the phone rang at five in the morning the following Tuesday, and I learned that our office was in flames. Next picture. As I headed to the door, the phone rang again, and it was my brother with the news that someone had flung Mol Molotov cocktails through the plate glass windows of the building my parents had been so proud to buy decades earlier as a symbol of their and the newspaper's success. As I drove the few blocks from my home to Broadway, I tried without success to guess what could have led someone to firebomb the press. Not until a fire department lieutenant asked, Written anything about Salman Rushdie lately? Did I have an inkling? Later, the FBI agent who headed the Joint Terrorism Task Force in charge of the investigation played a recording of the 911 call, claiming responsibility and saying the defense of Rushdie was the reason. Residents, elected officials, and community leaders, including many who had criticized the paper in the past, rallied behind it. But the most important source of aid came from the state's other community newspapers. Dozens reprinted the editorial that had provoked the bombing. Together with its publication by Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan in the Congressional Record and its reproduction in New York Newsday, they brought the message of a 13,000 circulation newspaper to a million readers, a stinging defeat for the terrorists who had sought to suppress it. 
For 10 years on the anniversary of the bombing, I wrote an editorial about Rushdie. It had two purposes, to remind readers that he remained underground and in danger and to send this message to the terrorists. You didn't win. The last in the series was among the editorials that won the Pulitzer Prize. In 1991, in an apartment building overlooking the Henry Hudson Parkway, a young mother named Alyssa Eilenberg watched soot falling on her terrace. <clears throat> Worried about what might be in the black gunk that rose from her apartment house incinerator and settled where her children played, she had a laboratory analyze it. The results made her an environmental crusader. The city was requiring landlords to phase incinerators out, but not fast enough for established environmental organizations or for Ms. Eilenberg, who formed the Riverdale Committee for Clean Air to focus on the issue. As community organizations almost always did, she visited the Riverdale Press to ask for help publicizing the committee's work, something we were, as always, happy to do. Some months later, Ms. Eilenberg learned from the environmentalist grapevine that the state had quietly approved a regional medical waste incinerator and it was being built on East 138th Street and Locust Avenue in the Port Morris section of the Bronx. Because the Riverdale Committee for Clean Air had begun holding forums in Riverdale about the incinerator, the Riverdale Press began to look into the issue of incineration at how the site for what turned out to be the state's largest medical waste incinerator had been chosen and how the permits had come to be granted. Karen Miller Medzen, a wonderful reporter, started making calls. She soon learned that though it was called the Bronx Lebanon Hospital Incinerator, in fact, a private company was behind the incinerator and it was headed by a former Koch administration official who had leveraged his political contacts. The hospital's nominal sponsorship gave the developer access to low interest state-sponsored bonds. Despite the South Bronx Community Board's claim that the project had widespread local support, Karen could find no community organization that he had ever even heard of it. A press editorial warned of the danger to air quality. Next slide. And called the decision to locate the incinerator in the South Bronx environmental racism. That editorial made its way to St. Anne's Church in Mott Haven, where its pastor photocopied it and began passing it out to parishioners, along with a call to a meeting locally. Soon, South Bronx residents began their own protests. The official reaction was a shoulder shrug. That's the editorial that I referred to. The Assuring alarmed residents that the facility was, quote, state of the art, regulators and the developer patronized them. Elected officials told them it was too late to do anything. But the press stayed on the story. It learned that when the chairman of the local community board had claimed that residents welcomed the incinerator because it would provide jobs, he was lying. Next, the press discovered that the chairman was on the payroll of the incinerator's developer. A congressional committee held a hearing. A federal grand jury opened a probe. The community board chairman was indicted for tax evasion for concealing the payments he took from the incinerator company. The politicians who supposed opposition to the incinerator would die down were surprised. The issue galvanized residents. They filed lawsuits, held teach-ins and demonstrated Joined by nuns and priests, they even sat down on the Bruckner Expressway during rush hour to dramatize their cause. And residents of Riverdale, including a rabbi from a local congregation, joined them. The press was just as unflagging as the residents were determined. Years of effort finally changed minds. To the surprise of no one, the regulatory agency's predictions that admissions would not follow the air proved wrong. Forced to stop relying on computer simulations and test what actually came out of the stacks, they found the so-called 
state-of-the-art incinerator was racking up violations, as many as 70 a week. In 1999, I watched a huge crane pry the stacks off the South Bronx incinerator. Years of eloquent, determined opposition led the state to withdraw its permits. <clears throat> As hundreds of school children, whose mothers and older brothers and sisters had marched and rallied at the site over the years cheered, the last remaining incinerator in New York City was dismantled. <clears throat> As the incinerator came down, Sister Patricia Howell, principal of St. Luke's School, exhorted the children to always remember the lesson of today. You are not helpless. And the children chanted, who makes history? We make history. The incinerator was built in stealth. Workers lied to people who asked what they were building. If it had not been for the unlikely circumstance that led the Riverdale Press to write about the South Bronx incinerator, the people who lived in Port Morris and Mott Haven and Hunts Point would not have known that a few blocks from their homes and their children's schools, the air was being poisoned. They would not have known that their public officials were cheating them. There would have been no newspaper to tell them so. Minutes after the announcement that I had won the Pulitzer Prize, the phones at the press lit up. Managing editor Pam Frederick took a call from the Wall Street Journal. The reporter didn't want to interview me. He wanted to check a fact. We've searched all our databases, he said, but we can't find your parent company. Pam didn't miss a beat. She's sitting right across from me, she said, smiling at my mother. Would you like to talk to her? Next slide, please. And there, there she is on the left with my brother, giving me a hug and a kiss. Now, that's one way of explaining the difference between community news and big media, but it's not the most important one. Big media, from the Times in print to CNN, on TV to Politico online, are focused on the famous, the notorious, and the powerful. Community news chronicles the lives and concerns of ordinary people. While many of the stories I've been telling you are about the press as a watchdog or an advocate, the fact is that every week the paper is filled with stories of the doings of neighborhood organizations, of school programs, of little league and high school sports. These stories provide the context for bold news coverage and outspoken editorials. In communities that aren't served by newspapers like the press, residents can't imagine that a newspaper really wants to know about churches and synagogues, fraternal organizations, schools, clubs and civic groups, births, marriages, anniversaries, graduations, promotions, leave takings, and deaths. Yet these are the organizations and events that occupy most of the non-working lives of all of us. How can they not matter? If they give meaning to the lives of individuals and families, how can they not give meaning to communities? One of the things I've repeated frequently since winning the Pulitzer Prize is my hope that it demonstrates that community newspapers are not journalism's minor leagues. It is my conviction that community news is crucial to preserving our democracy. More and more, Americans feel they don't have the power to make changes in their own communities and their own nation. Too often, mass media contributes to that sense of helplessness. Many Americans feel so isolated that they no longer believe their concerns or their opinions are shared. If they're troubled, they think no one else is, or that what's troubling them is a personal problem, not a public one. It's liberating when the local newspaper suggests that if a child isn't succeeding at school, maybe we need better schools. Or if a developer wants to transform the character of your neighborhood, 
Maybe the neighbors should have something to say about it. Community news offers readers the knowledge that their neighbors share their concerns. It seeks to convince or remind people, remind the people they serve, that they have the power to influence the decisions that affect their lives. It helps them to exercise that power. Choosing these reminiscences to share with you has reinforced my belief in the importance of community news and its unique mission. And I'm thankful to the Kingsbridge Historical Society for inviting me to reflect on my years at the editor's desk. Well, happy. it's our pleasure, buddy. <laughs> that was that was incredible. I mean, I had no idea that, that the role the press played in the uh, incinerator deal and many of those other stories. Um, you know, I was talking to you earlier, and everyone else who's on the Zoom, if you want to type in a question now, it would be a good time if you have a question for Buddy. Um, you know, one thing we were talking about earlier that I thought was interesting was, you know, I was asking you if, if being a local paper, if there was ever a concern that, you know, going after a local politician or being critical of a local politician would, you know, hurt your ability to really cover local news if you were to, you know, run afoul of, of, of such a person. So, I mean, what, did, did that calculation ever really factor in, you know, in terms of you don't really want to alienate your, your local representatives because they're all you got in a local setting? Well, honestly, it never happened. Um, I think it never happened in part because there really is a uh, kind of a symbiotic relationship between the press and uh, elected representatives. It's the way they get their message out. And I was always as editor willing to publish their message along with whatever context was required to surround it. Um, my father did face a boycott by the 50th precinct early on in uh, the existence of the Riverdale Press in the 50s. Uh, he wrote a blistering editorial, uh, headlined, The Press is Not Invited, uh, and talked about why it's important for uh, public institutions to share their, what they're doing and their concerns with the public. And the way to do it is uh, through the local paper uh, and the 50th Precinct. As far as I know, I was a little kid, but I believe the 50th Precinct back down. Um, I really was never, it never entered my mind, but I wasn't, I wouldn't have been concerned had there been such a boycott because there are always ways to cover what an elected official or a, uh, an official organization is doing uh, without hearing from them. You always would call them to get their reaction to whatever it is that you're reporting on. But if they don't choose to answer, well, you just say uh, they didn't want to answer. Uh, so I don't think that's ever been a, a, an issue. Advertiser boycotts, of course, are always of concern. Um, and we face several of them. Uh, and the only answer is uh, to say, to examine what you did. And if you think what you did was right, then you live with it. Thanks. Uh, we have a question here from Abby Nering from a little outfit known as the Riverdale Press. And she ask question number one, what advice do you have for reporters starting their careers in New York City today? Starting your careers, and I'm sorry, I missed the last part. In New York City today. I think you probably made a good choice. Uh, if you work for a news organization that doesn't just take your stuff and put it into print, but rather um, edits it and gives you feedback on your work and gives you guidance as you go about your reporting. I always regarded myself, I used to say to the great annoyance of the Dean of uh, Columbia Journalism School that I was the Dean of the best journalism school in New York. Uh, and I think that's the answer. If you find a teaching newsroom, that's the way to start as a re uh, reporter in New York or anywhere else. And her second, the second part of her question was, uh, Community Board 8 land use chair, Chuck Mordler, recently told me New York City cannot survive and be the empire city of the world unless it takes care of all of the people in it. And that means providing housing at every level. 
Amid a historic housing crisis, do you think Riverdale can accommodate more affordable housing without turning into canyons of stone? I suspect, you know, without being an expert on this, um, I've always thought, for example, that it would make sense to put another story on the on Johnson Avenue stores and make them residential. And I don't think that would have a deleterious effect on the character of the community. But I do think that what makes Riverdale unique and uh, what draws people to live in Riverdale is, as I said, this the, it's open space, it's beauty, uh, it's natural beauty, and it's mix of housing. So I'm sure there are places where it would be appropriate to build more housing, but uh, what I'm hearing too often in the debate about so-called nimbyism is that uh, in the quest for more and more and more housing, uh, it, we need to, if necessary, obliterate all of those things that give the community character. Thanks. Um, here's another one from Gary Larkin. Hi, buddy. What role do you see the Riverdale Press playing now, all these years later, given this time of misinformation? Uh, I don't see the role that the Riverdale Press should play now is very different from the role that the Riverdale Press pay, played in 2005 or 2006 or 2008, uh, which is when my brother and I sold the paper to uh, the Richard brothers. Um, and uh, misinformation can only be combated with true information. Uh, that's your job, Gary. Here's another one. Um, do you and your brother have any influence now on the on the editorial stances of the press? No. Okay. Um, let's see here. Ah, okay. This was from Stephanie Coggins. Buddy, do you think that a Riverdale Press column regarding regarding local history? both of long ago and more recent events like those you've recounted would have a positive community building effect on the residents living in Greater Riverdale. Stephanie, I wrote a column called Out of the Past um, where once a month, I believe it was, um, I looked at, looked back uh, for, first 45 years ago and then 50 years ago uh, using back issues of the press. I don't know how much influence it had, but I do know that I got an incredible amount of feedback. People loved it. Uh, it was, I think, one of the best read um, parts of the paper along probably with police speed. Um, so I, I think it would be an asset if uh, uh, in, in that respect, but what influence it would have, I honestly don't know. And this looks like it is the last one. Hello from Stephen and Jan Marks in California. Any chance you are going to write a book about Even your career? Plus eighty one alumnus, <laughs> classmates together. Okay. <laughs> so they're looking forward to your book. Are you going to be writing a book about your career at the Riverdale Press? Uh, probably not, Steve and Janet. Uh, I am. I you know in in preparing for this talk, I look back. Um, at many years of my editorial writing and wondered whether stitching together some of the better editorials with some kind of a narrative might be of interest to people. Um, so conceivably, I may pursue that, but at the moment, I don't have any real plans to, to write a book about uh, my experience. Do you think I should? <laughs> well, you have um, another opportunity ahead of you here a job offer this is from gary larkin are you willing to bring that column back i would love it as the editor of the riverdale press you mean have me write the column is that what sounds is that? like it <laughs> well how do you pay <laughs> uh and there is another problem gary i don't have back issues of the riverdale press um if you can convince i'll make a deal with you if you can conv convince your publisher to digitize all of the back issues of the Riverdale Press, I will write such a column for a year. How's that? Yeah, great. Yeah, there are a number of uh, questions about uh, accessing back issues and the archives. 
Um, it would be great if that could happen because, and there are grants out there, organizations that give grants for newspapers to digitize their um, their archives. And I think that would be really great to have access to all that. It would be wonderful if they were digitized. In the meantime, um, in my time, we gave first bound volume, bound volumes and microfilm of the paper to the New York Public Library. They were initially at the Riverdale and Kingsbridge branches, but uh, the last time I checked, they felt they couldn't preserve the bound volumes, so they sent them downtown. Uh, the New York Historical Society had microfilm. The New York State Archive has microfilm. So those would run up until the time that we sold the paper. And then shortly after we sold the paper, it began to appear online. And so there is uh, some sort of digital archive following you know, from 2008 on. Uh, so people, if people are interested in looking at back issues of the press, it's a schlep, but they are available in that respect. Um, well, I wanted to thank everybody for um, joining us this evening. And I wanted to give you, um, invite you to join the Kingsbridge Historical Society as a member, just 10 bucks a year. Or if you'd like to make a donation, you could do so um, at that URL in front of you. And um, we may have another Zoom presentation before we resume live uh, presentations in the spring. So be on the lookout for that sometime in March. Uh, thanks again, buddy. Thank you. All right. Good night, everybody.